Hey friends, welcome to episode 164 of Stand Up. I've got six excellent guests reacting to the nomination or the choice of Kamala Harris to run with Joe Biden. I'm about to tell you who they are. I'm Pete Dominic. Time to stand up with me right now. Hello, Stand Up community, and welcome to the show. I'm really excited about today's special Very special episode. It's like the special episode of a sitcom that you used to care about. Remember sitcoms when you'd sit there with your whole family? Ooh, went off on a tangent pretty quick there. I reached out to several people yesterday. I got in touch and was able to tape with six of them to get their reactions and analysis of Joe Biden's choice of Kamala Harris, Senator Kamala Harris of California, to be his running mate. And I'm really excited that they are... Oh, they were able to join me, the people that were. Uh, Danielle Moody, who's a political commentator and host of Woke AF Daily, lawyer and legal analyst Midwin Charles, activist and commentator April Rain, activist and commentator, host of her own show and Majority FM, Nomiki Konst, Fordham professor Dr. Christina Greer, and Morgan State University professor and political commentary or analyst Dr. Jason Johnson. All six of them joined me. What did I got? Four black women, one white woman and one black man if you're paying attention and if that matters and I think it does because I wanted to capture the importance and magic of the moment especially for black women women in general and of course Dr. Jason Johnson is an African American man and one the only guest who is a little bit more critical but his criticism actually came uh, mostly channeled through his black students at his historically black university and uh, he's my uh, last guest so uh, stay tuned for that but I just wanted to take a moment here at the top of the show to I don't like doing this because I feel like it's kind of boring and self-serving but I have to do it it's part of the the show if I work for a corporation of course they'd make me do this all of the time they'd coach me to do it as they did at Sirius XM and other networks of course make you do this but it's defining the value of of this show and why you would be a paid subscriber and hopefully why you are already. And there's a whole bunch of people, new people signed up today that I'll give shout outs to in a moment. But I remember back in December in one of my lowest moments after losing my gig, worrying about what my future held and whether or not I'd be able to continue doing what I love so much to be able to make a living and support my family. And I reached out to all types of people, including Kelly Carlin, who was on yesterday's show, and Van Jones, who's yet to be a guest on the show. I really should get him on. Although some of you may not like him. There's a lot of criticism of of Van's commentary, but I like him a lot. He's a personal friend of mine. And when I reached out to Van Jones, we had this amazing conversation where he told me that things for me would be okay, and that I needed to recognize how much social capital I had. I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but basically explained it to me. He's like, brother, it's the people that you know. That's valuable to folks. The fact that I answered the phone at 630 in the morning, you think I would do that for anybody else? That's what he said to me. I'll never forget it. I thought he was uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. He was in California on West Coast time when I called him. But I finally realized what that meant as it started to play out. And that's why I wanted to just take a moment to say, if you're a subscriber to the show, maybe you can define however you see fit why you would pay for a subscription. But I think the best actual concrete reason is the value in this show, the guests and my ability to get those guests and hopefully my ability to ask them good questions and conduct a conversation that is interesting, enlightening, at times entertaining to you. That's the value. Today at about four o'clock, Joe Biden announced that he had chosen Senator Kamala Harris to be his running mate. And I put on the shelf what I had planned for tomorrow's show to earlier interviews that I had done and decided I was going to, in a moment's notice, change direction and reach out to several people, mostly black women, whose contacts I had. Right. That's the value that I was able to contact these people and that they would say, yes, that's the value. That's what you're paying for. I do this five days a week. Most days there are two guests. Sometimes there are more. Sometimes it's just one. It's never just me. Never. This is the most of me you get at the top of the show, defining what the show is about and why it's worth you paying for it. And it's that. 
It's the, the fact that I've got a long enough career and good enough relationships and reputation and I do a good enough job that these people would join me on a moment's notice that they would want to talk to me and that I would be able to then put it together to share it with you. That's what you're paying for. That's what my value is. And when you think about mainstream corporate media from CNN to MSNBC, Fox News, New York Times, Sirius XM, and you think about what you're paying for them and what you're getting, I would argue, believe it or not, the value here on a show like mine is, is higher because of the length of the conversations, the detail I'm able to get into, the honesty with which it's done, the transparency with which it's done, because you have a great impact on me, especially if you have a paid subscription and you have direct access and influence on me. So that is the value of what I'm doing. Well, several other people are doing as well, but specifically, it's who I know. After 14 years in media and several years before that in entertainment, exclusively, specifically comedy, I know a lot of people. I've got a lot of good friends in, in the world that are willing to talk to me and allow me to record it and share it with you. That's my value. That's where it lies. Thank you for subscribing and, and thank you for indulging in this because I was able to get these six people and turn this around and make it work. And hopefully you think that's worth paying as little as five dollars uh, for a subscription. Because that's what I want to be able to do every day for you. And by the way, if you listen to one episode or every minute of all five episodes a week, doesn't matter. The point is I'm not just putting out one episode. That's why it's worth paying for. I'm doing five a week, two guests a day most days, and hopefully more soon and live shows soon. And we have a whole community that we get together and hang out and learn from each other and connect with each other. There's a lot of value there. And I thank you to all the subscribers who are paying for it. And that's the end of this explanation for why I hope that you'll sign up for a paid subscription. And by the way, I'm really excited about uh, three new folks who signed up with $5 subscriptions today. Hello, Chris Slayton. Hello, somebody who calls themselves a wonderful Willa. Hello, Victoria Garcia. Welcome to the Stand Up community. And a special thank you to Dennis Addison, who just became a $25 subscriber and I woke up to that one he subscribed at like six in the morning I woke up and saw that and it really started me off uh, on a great foot I love waking up to subscriptions because it means more money for the show more that I can invest in the show and into my new studio the shadio coming along everybody getting it painted and sanded this week and putting the the carpeting down and I'm getting closer and closer if I can now just figure out how to thread a cat 5 ethernet cable my oh me okay so let's get to the show shall we Yesterday, Joe Biden chose the former attorney general of the state of California, a 55-year-old two-term senator, the daughter of immigrants from Jamaica and India, and the wife of a Jewish man. If elected, she'll be the first woman, the first Asian-American, and the first black vice president. She's the first black woman on the ticket, the first graduate of a historically black college or university, the first woman from her sorority, and, well, quite a few more firsts. Part of the critiques of Kamala Harris, according to political, at least. And there's plenty, obviously, as there is of all of us personally or politically. They write at Politico, uh, Senator Harris has faced persistent criticisms for her prosecutorial, prosecutorial record, including concerns that she was too cautious to lead on sweeping changes. Her embrace in recent years of far reaching changes has won over some skeptics and she helped steer Democratic efforts to pass police reform this summer. A child of the civil rights movement whose parents were active in the 1960s marches, Kamala Harris joined Black Lives Matter demonstrations this summer. In the U.S. Senate, Harris's must-see cross-examinations, Politico continues, of Republican witnesses and hearings helped elevate her national profile. She was considered a top-tier presidential contender when she launched her own campaign last year before more than 22,000 excited supporters in her hometown of Oakland, California. But even as she displayed flashes of brilliance as a candidate, including the clash with Biden in the Miami debate, which temporarily boosted her in polls and helped her raise millions of dollars, Harris struggled with consistency and seesawed between health care policies. And finally, in closing in this part of what I am reading in Politico, and maybe I'm reading too long, someone told me never read this long and a broadcast, but fuck it. Political rights. Senator Harris's campaign unraveled under the weight of a confusing message and an unclear chain of command atop her staff, ending in mutiny amid 
late fall layoffs. She flatlined into low single digits before dropping out before the Iowa caucuses or a vote was cast for her. So, like I said, I reach out to mostly black women to try to capture the moment and energy of this historic choice. And I think that's just what we did. I was really impressed, as always, with my guests and their Thoughts on things, you might not agree with them, and I certainly could have gotten a wider variety of opinions, I suppose, but these are the folks who I got, and I'm really proud of it, and I'm super proud of today's broadcast, today's podcast. So thanks for listening, thanks for supporting the podcast, and there's a paid subscription link in the show notes if you want to sign up or go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic, and enough from me, let's get this started. Here's my conversation with Danielle Moody, kicking us off right now hello there she is hi she's got the news on i have the news on in the back wait are you recording i'm recording (laughs) oh okay (laughs) did you not can you just read my last text out loud and tell me how much (laughs) of a douche i am um wait what does it say coming in hot I'm such a jackass. I'm here. I'm here. Um, Hi. I'm so excited to uh, talk to you to get your reaction. I'm going to try to get uh, uh, as many hot takes as I can. I've got Danielle Moody at D2 Cents on Twitter, host of Woke AF Daily. You should listen to her show. She's one of my favorite people to listen to, talk to, and get her opinion on all things. Your hot take, Danielle, what do you think? I am super excited about Biden's choice. I'm excited um, about Kamala Harris. I predicted this back in December of 2019, that this was going to be a choice. I wrote a column uh, in Zora magazine about it. While Kamala was my second choice for VP pick, um, I knew that she was going to be the smartest choice for Joe Biden and somebody that was going to back him, to elevate him, and to frankly prosecute the case against Donald Trump. Who's your first choice? Stacey Abrams. What does Kamala bring to the ticket? So if we remember, Kamala brings to the ticket to me the fact that, first of all, and I tweeted this earlier, that I can rest easy knowing that Donald Trump is not going to be let off the hook for his crimes against humanity and his crimes against this country. When Kamala Harris was face to face with Brett Kavanaugh, when she was face to face with William Barr, she takes them to task. Uh, They stumble. They lose focus. Um, She is incredibly smart. She's incredibly quick. She's incredibly qualified. And I think that she is a force. And Donald Trump, Mike Pence and the rest of the sycophants should be scared out of their minds. What is the is there a word to give to the look on Kamala Harris's face after she asks Brett Kavanaugh or the AG the questions she asked them? You know that look. What is that? Oh yeah, the look is like do you think I'm stupid? <laughs> right? It's the, it's the, and like do you think do you think we're dumb? Right? Like that's that's the look. Like she's asking she knows that they are lying straight to her face. But like, let me let me ask this again. Right. Like she had to have, you know, William Barr had to figure out, you know, the word sure and the word like complete. Right. Well, what do you mean by that? Are, do you think we're dumb? right? Um, I think that Kamala is going to bring a lot to this ticket and she's going to have Joe Biden's back. And I think that in areas where Joe Biden may be weak, right, in terms of his public speaking, in terms of his ability to hammer, you know, um, to hammer Donald Trump and the Republican Party. Kamala Harris is young. um, She is savvy. And I think that what happened to her with regard to the presidential bid is that she was in a very crowded field, right? And um, while I remember being on set at MSNBC when she announced and how excited everybody was about her announcement, she couldn't find her footing. It was an incredibly crowded field. It was also a different time. And so for people who think that, oh, well, black people didn't support her then, it was because black people will support who we believe that the majority will get behind. Right. Right. Important and point. The rea- and, and, and that is that is not about being followers. It's about being pragmatic. Right. And it is about understanding the existential threat that Donald Trump 
is to America, is to our democracy, is to black people. You'd love to vote for a black person. Color. But if 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 black people uh, think that this black person is not going to win and leave them with the white supremacists, right. they're not voting then for that, that black that, person. That is, then that that is not exactly. And so, you know, I, I'm right now I'm battling with people on Twitter. They're just like, well, she, you know, she was a prosecutor that locked up black. OK, mm-hmm. that's great. We have a fascist in the White House. So you can come at me when they are sworn in about what policies they put out, how they're going to rehab the criminal justice system, whether or not we're going to defund the police. You can talk to me about that on January 22nd. Any conversation before then is moot. I don't care. How will the Trumpers, the conservatives, the Republicans go after Kamala Harris? What are her vulnerabilities? They they already started. Donald Trump already had tweeted out an, uh, uh, an attack ad. And it was calling her a phony. It's saying that she's Hmm. going to, you know, up taxes by trillions of dollars. It's saying, you know, that she's from the radical left, which is so far from the truth. One of the issues with Kamala Harris that some people had was that she wasn't progressive enough, that she was that she was very much middle of the road and a moderate. This is why. The BS that they're going to try and throw at her is not going to stick because her record says the opposite. There was a time in politics, I think, every time before Trump, where when the nominee was announced this way, the the incumbent would say congratulations and be respectful. Yeah, I don't know what time that was, but didn't it used to be? The, I thought that, that was always the case with. Yeah, prior. I mean that time is far and far gone. What Any does, type of political norms, we're we're past that. What does this mean for the energy that she brings to the ticket? There's been so much consternation about who it would be. It would be a woman. Would it be a black woman? What does this mean for black folks, black voters, and just the energy in general? I think that it points, you know, we kept saying, uh, those of us in the media for the longest time, especially those of us that are black, have been saying that the VP pick needs to point to the future of the Democratic Party. And with the signaling of Kamala Harris and her and, and being Biden's pick, it is stating very clear and unequivocally that this is the future of the country. This is the future of the party. Right. We're not going to hide from the demographic shift. We're going to lean all the way into it. Donald Trump wants to make the case about, you know, the rise, the the second wave of white supremacy and the rise of Nazis and, you know, and all of these things that he gives. It's not even a nod to. He congratulates and uplifts. This needed to be a choice that was signaling just how opposite. Right. Uh, Just how distinct the Democratic Party is from the the backwards nature that Trump wants to pull us back into and the forward thinking that Democrats are putting on the table. What does it mean for you personally? I saw your tweet saying something to the I I just lost it. The effect that this could get me back to Washington. Yeah. So, you know, I left Washington, D.C. after, you know, living there for close to 20 years Uh, working in policy, working on the Hill, being a lobbyist, you know, doing all of those things. And I left after the Obamas left because I said that there was, you know, nothing left to be there for. Um, With the appointment of uh, Kamala Harris, uh, this black woman is going to need all of the support and energy um, that she needs. Uh, She's going to need fixers. She's going to need, you know, policy folks, um, because I believe that Kamala Harris will be running in 2024. Right. And so, um, you know, I am thinking to myself today, if there was anyone that could pull me back uh, from New York to D.C., it might be this ticket. I really appreciate you talking to me on a moment's notice. Great to get your perspective. You're the first person I thought of and the first person on the hot takes. Thank you, Danielle. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Pete. All right, now let's go to Midwin Charles. She's a lawyer, a contributor to Essence Magazine, a legal analyst at CNN and MSNBC, and she's the founder of law firm Midwin Charles and Associates. Let's see if she picks up. Hey, how are you? Hi. What's up? Thank you for letting me call you. You're welcome. I am very excited to talk to you. I just saw all of your tweets, and I wanted to get your uh, quick hot takes on sure. the choice, the big choice, Kamala Harris. Ab- absolutely, absolutely. Um, I am. You know what? It's funny. I 
had thought all along that she would be the pick. I thought she would be the pick that would bring about the most excitement. I thought she would be the pick that um, had the most name recognition. I thought she was the pick that had the most experience. Uh, And I thought she was the pick because she had run for statewide office um, um, twice, right, as a state attorney general and then as Mm -hmm. senator in California, but also because she had run as president, that she also, for the most part, was the most vetted candidate, uh, you know, woman in the running in terms of all the other women who were running or, or in the run for VP or being considered rather for VP. Um, so I, I'm not surprised she's the pick, but I'm surprised at how it's made me feel like I'm sitting here nervous, but nervous with excitement because of what it means. I think um, it means, one, that the Democratic Party finally is recognizing the power um, and the commitment and the consistency that black women bring to the Democratic Party in a way that no other group brings. Black men, too, but black women more so. Mm -hmm. Because not only do black women come out and vote in higher numbers in Democratic uh, uh, tickets across the country. So not just for the president, but across the country. It's important to point that out, right? It was black women that that brought Doug Jones over the top for that win for that Alabama Senate seat that that Jeff Sessions had abandoned. And Doug Jones, as you know, was was uh, fighting to get that Senate seat against Roy Moore, who was accused of pedophilia. And yet the number of white women who voted him, who voted for Roy Moore was just unbelievable. Um, uh, And it was black women who voted overwhelmingly for Doug Jones and got him that. It was also black women who voted overwhelmingly for Terry McAuliffe when he was running for governor of Virginia and brought about that win. So not only do black women do that, but black women for the party also organize the most, you know, voter voter uh, registration drives, Uh, you know, organizing uh, bus rides for the elderly to get them to the polls. But black women also fight back on voter suppression. A lot of black women are taking the lead in fighting voter suppression efforts throughout the country to, to suppress the black vote. So black women are invaluable when it comes to the Democratic Party. And it's about time the party recognize that and allow black women to lead. Why? Because we we all we keep making the right call. Right. In 2016, black women voted for Hillary. Ninety four percent. Ninety four percent black men. I think it was 88 percent Latinos. I think it was 70 something percent white women, like 47 percent. So, again, you know, black women are making the right call on, on these candidates. We are committed in a way that other groups are not. And it's time the party recognize um the fact that black women should be in leadership positions in the party. We, you know, black, black women have earned it and black women deserve it. So this pick is just amazing. And the excitement that you see right now with people like just really excited on Twitter is what we needed. Right. Exactly. I was going to ask ask you to uh, take me inside a room filled with black women right now. Oh, yeah. No, it's going to it's going to be lit. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to it's going to be lit. It's going to be lit like this is the sort of excitement. Yes. That everything. Yeah. All the boringness of Joe Biden. Right. Is is reduced. If right. And. Right. And just to add another feather to black women and, and black folks, or black men to cap in terms of, you know, Joe Biden owes this nomination to black women. Mm-hmm. Remember, his his candidacy was on life support before South Carolina. He had no money. He was outspent by um, uh, what's his name again? Um, oof, the Pete name is me. No, no, no. The other one. Uh Oh, Bernie Lord. Sanders. Yes. How Bernie quickly Sanders. we forget. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's no fine. disrespect. No disrespect meant at all. I'm just doing four different things right now at the same time. But, you know, Bernie Sanders uh, had outspent Joe Biden and had a lot more money than Joe Biden. You know, people were saying, you know, and Joe Biden hadn't even won uh, a primary, I think, up until South Carolina. Right. Uh, so and it was black people, black people in South Carolina with a um, endorsement by Representative Clyburn that that resuscitated 
Biden's candidacy. Right. So he owes he owes black people and and black women in particular. If this VP slot. great point, if uh, Mike Pence is still the VP candidate uh, on the ticket and agrees to debate Kamala Harris, what does that look like? I don't listen. I don't even think he would show up. How about that? <laughs> he a, might not. He might not show up. That's I why. Mean, that's why I couched it the way I did. If he agrees, yeah, yeah. Uh, right, right, right. I, I think you know. I think she'll do su- su- superbly well, right? I, you know, we've seen her in the debates. She did very well in the debates. She had a few sort of hiccups um, and a few things that I think she needs to be prepared. Have you for. ever seen Piranha attack a piece of fresh meat? <laughs> yeah, totally. That's what totally. I'm thinking of. With Kamala totally. Harris, I mean, she's taking yeah. on uh, a lot smarter, stronger people. Uh, Bill Barr yeah. and Brett Kavanaugh. Mike Pence is stone cold stupid. She'd eat him alive. Exactly, you're right. I, 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 you know, that's such a good point about how she has taken on some of the most powerful men in the Senate. And what I loved about it is she never appeared scared. She never appeared to be meek. She never appeared to be humble. And that's what we need, particularly when dealing with 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 Republicans, Mm -hmm. is we need Democrats who are not going to be meek and humble. The time for that has passed. We need we need uh, elected officials that are willing to point out the hypocrisies and the inconsistencies of the Republican Party and also the fact that they aren't aren't governing. So they want to be in charge and they want to lead, but they aren't governing. And how they've handled this virus, I think, is an example of that. Midwin Charles, on a moment's notice, I really appreciate you doing this for me with me. It's you're great welcome. to hear your excitement, enthusiasm, and obviously your analysis is always as uh, excellent. Let's talk longer Thank soon. You. Thank you. All right, let me reach out to April Rain now, who was on earlier this week. We had a long conversation. Let's get her a hot take on the pick of Kamala Harris. Hello, my friend. Hi, twice in one week. <laughs> it's a special time. I am honored. Thank you for taking my call. Of course. I apologize for having to put you off. How bit. dare you? You made me wait four and a half minutes. I. <laughs> you want to know what I did? Not really, but share anyway. Nothing. Oh. Okay. I didn't do anything. I just waited. There's nothing wrong with that, though. <laughs> nothing is good sometimes. Okay. Hot takes. Everybody's hot. Take. First of all, is your uh, phone ringing off the hook? Mm, uh, it's not crazy. Okay. It's not crazy. It's not like Oscar so white time, but you know. Fair enough. You're um, in there. All right. Your personal reaction to the pick of Kamala Harris. Uh, where, where, where did you have her in the original nominee fight? Where did you have her in the VP pick? Sure. Um, it, Kamala Harris was one of my top three choices from the very beginning along with Julian Castro and Elizabeth Warren. So, you know, and then people started to drop out and so on. And so I I was very disappointed to see her leave the race Mm. because I think she's incredibly strong and qualified as um, as a candidate and as a leader. So then when we shifted to vice president, um, I, I, I definitely wanted a black woman to be the vice president. I, I think it's necessary uh, just to get things done. Uh, and I, so she she was definitely right there um, at near the top, if not at the top. And so I, I'm very happy with this choice. I am happier than I thought I would be. Mm. You know, I, I said on Twitter, you know, I actually felt something <laughs> for the first time in years with respect to, uh, you know, probably since 2012 with respect to, you know, elections and, and our future and progress. And so I, for me, Kamala Harris brings a glimmer of hope of maybe someday returning to how things should or getting to the place, not returning, but getting to the place where things should be. You know, I'm really interested to see if um, hopefully President Biden wants to serve a full eight or right. just four, um, you know, but but I think either way, she will be absolutely ready uh, to run in 2024 or 2028. Yeah, if he's elected in, in, in 2024, he would be 106. So that's, that's pr- right. pretty old. God. That's not right. What that the, can't be right. What? <laughs> you didn't carry the one. <laughs> what is it about Senator Harris? 
can. You know, she's, she, I, I can cuss, right? She's, she's yep. a badass. Yeah. I mean, she, she really is. You know, I, there was a lot of disinformation and smear campaigns and tactics about her, you know, Kamala is a cop. And in fact, she called herself at one point a cop. But, you know, I guess me having a legal background, I understood what that meant, right? You, you know, you're the top prosecutor for the state and you work hand in hand with law enforcement. And yeah, it makes sense that you call yourself a cop. Um, but, you know, I, She's been fantastic in the Senate. The only reason why um, I was less than 100 percent behind her being the VP pick is that I think she would also make a fantastic attorney general. But I'm okay with my president. Right, right. We'll we'll figure out. We'll figure out somebody else for for attorney general. But, you know, because we've seen how she goes toe to toe and and spares, you know, no feelings, no expense when she's getting down to business um, in the Senate. And so, you know, even I mean, first term senators, you know, Barack Obama, now Kamala Harris, there's, there's something special about the work that they do while they're there as they maybe make plans, uh, you know, bigger plans, have loftier goals. Um, I'm also super, I don't, I can't remember if you and I talked about this, but that whole ambitious thing is horrible and so misogynistic. Um, And so, you know, there were definitely, there was a group of black women leaders. There was a group of black male leaders who were coming to not her defense because she doesn't need one, but to support her um, in this time. And, And I hope that we see that support continue. What about, I mean, it's no surprise that he picked uh, a woman because he said he was going to pick a woman, but we've mostly yep. been focused on her skin color, ethnicity. What, what does a woman being on a ticket with Joe Biden in 2020 against a misogynist and racist at the top of the ticket? I mean, we saw that obviously with Hillary and he was somehow able to, to turn the tables on her, uh, you know, at, at, at talking about Bill Clinton's past transgressions. What about just having a woman on the ticket? And like you said, most likely one that would uh, succeed him. I I think it's fantastic. I I think that it's balanced that Biden needed. Uh, You know, I think that her race and ethnicity is important. I think that her gender identity is important. I think that her youth uh, relatively youth is is important. You know that she is going to bring so much to the table. You know, I remember you know months ago people were saying, oh, well, it shouldn't be Kamala because you know California isn't in play, and so you know she's not bringing anything to the ticket. But she's bl- she's bringing black women to the ticket, and we are the backbone of the Democratic Party. Right. And so we're going to see, you know, she's a member of a very esteemed um, black female sorority. Right. And so we got all those folks. She is a, a, an alumnus of a historically black college and university. So we've got all those folks. Um, so, you, you know, I think we can see it on social media that she truly not just me, but she is energizing millions of people um, who, you know, maybe she wasn't the their first choice, either for president or vice president. But she is someone that we can strongly get behind. What about black men? What is the energy that she brings to black male voters? (laughs) (laughs) I um, yeah. I I hope that they, you know, there's there's misogyny and there's misogynoir, right? Spelled just a little bit differently, but that's uh, misogyny directed specifically at black women. Um, And so I am hopeful, you know, as I mentioned, you know, there was. Um, I think a hundred or something black male leaders who, you know, signed a letter of support for her. I hope that they get on board. You know, we know that um, the disinformation and the misinformation that Trump is putting out there is targeting specifically black men, you know, and so we've seen the walk away campaign, you know, Kanye running is part of that, right? Thinking that he's going to get the black male mm. rap enthusiast or something or other. Mm. Um, it, it, so it, it remains to be seen. I am, I am, I am hopeful um, that they will see her as a qualified person, that they will see, um, you know, someone from their family, you know, their mother, their aunt, um, their cousin in Kamala Harris and, you know, and realize how much work that person in their life does to keep things running, to, you know, to make sure everything is working the way it should. And they sort of transfer that respect 
um, to Kamala Harris and to the Biden Harris ticket. Do you see any vulnerabilities or lines of attack uh, that she'll have to deal with that are obvious in your mind? Well, you know, I, I think that people are going to come out of her because she's a woman. You know, there, are, as we spoke about, you know, the other day, there are lots of women who don't believe a woman should be she should hold um, office, you know, this high, you know, especially when she's one breath away, literally from being the president. Um, I think there was concern about her record in California, you know, she truancy and, you know, and, and she's dealt with um, and, and discussed a lot of those issues that she didn't actually put any children in jail or parents in jail for truancy and that kind of thing. So she's going to need to overcome it. Um, but I can't imagine, but I'm not sure where those attacks are going to come from because they damn sure aren't going to come from Pence. I cannot wait. October 7th, I'm ready to get it tattooed on my forehead. There's going to be all kinds of snacks in this house as we watch him him become uh, eviscerated on live TV by Kamala Harris. He he just he doesn't have the range. Do you think that Mike Pence's wife will allow him to be on stage with <laughs> Kamala Harris? I think that she will be waiting in the wings with, you know, like a little sweat towel and a, and a sippy cup. <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> sippy cup. I'm here for I'm, I'm here for supportive marriages. <laughs> April Rain, thank you for joining me in a moment's notice at Rain of April. Follow her. Thank you so much, my friend. My pleasure. Anytime. All right. Now I want to check in with very smart political mind, Nomiki Konst. Here we go with Nomiki. Hello. Hey, friend. Hi, Pete. How you doing? I am. I, I'm fired up and energized and ready to go. Please don't. Please don't. Take me down. <laughs> Ruin it. Please don't hurt me. I, I mean, why would I do that? I don't You're know. You're my, my pal. I know. Well, you, I didn't think you would attack me personally. I thought you might be critical of uh, the, the choice of Kamala Harris. I don't know. Uh, I am. I, this is where I am in, in the world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> fascism has arrived and we need to do everything to stop it, even if it means throwing um, a wet cloth at it. <laughs> If that like suffocates it for a little bit uh, so that later on we can we can go for a more progressive um, agenda. You know, uh, listen, I'm a, I'm a progressive. You know it. I, I would have loved to have a more progressive choice as a vice presidential nominee. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we need to understand the dynamics of this country and understand that. Uh, we have a generational, a seismic generational change that's about to shift um, and is shifting this country. And so uh, we have to step up and really push the Biden Harris administration to really respond to working people out there because there's no there's there's no time for neoliberalism. There's no time for incrementalism. But, you know, we don't stage those fits now. We got to win. What does she bring to the ticket? Well, I think what she brings to the ticket is, um, listen, we're in a really important moment with these uprisings around the country. And I, I think um, I credit the Biden uh, campaign for understanding and recognizing that and recognizing that was a weak suit of his in particular um, and responding to the people who are crying out for more representation, uh, women of color on the ticket. And so just that in itself is historic. Um, I think what she brings to the ticket is, you know, she is one of the first women of color as a senator. Um, she has the Senate experience, the federal experience that you do need when you go into an administration. And, you know, just comparatively to Susan Rice, for instance, I think, you know, when when the last few days that's been a big conversation topic, I think Susan Rice did not have the legislative experience needed right. uh, in this type of climate. And so she does understand the legislative process um, in a deeper way than many of, of the other contenders did. Um, you know, she represents a state that is more progressive. And so she'll also... I think they're going to be pressuring her as well in her own state. Um, I think because of her her record on prosecutorial uh, issues, I think we as progressives need to look at that as an opportunity to force her to be better on those issues. And I think she will have to, given the climate and given how the Black Lives Matter movement in particular has pushed back on that. She has a duty now and an obligation to stand up for, for people of color across the country who are being, uh, you know, incarcerated, uh, wrongly convicted, targeted, shot, killed, imprisoned. Um, their communities have been and devastated, uh, whether it's, you know, a long legacy of systemic racism in this country that is rooted in, in, um, 
in slavery, our, our original sin, uh, all the way to modern day redlining. Um, she has to, she has to bring those things to the table. This is, you know, I think the movement has been critical. The Black Lives Matter movement has been critical of the Obama administration for not responding to them. And so I think right. this is something that she has to do. And she knows that. She, yeah, I was going to say, you just said it right there. And she knows that th- th- there's no way she, she won't harness the energy of the movement, right? Like she's not right. going to, as you said earlier, throw a wet blanket on, on the civil rights movement of our time, right. especially uh, because it's safer now. It's, it's much more popular. Public approval of Black exactly. Lives Matter is much more popular. So it's really not that risky political. Fair to say? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, fair to say, you know, if they're being tactical politicians, then, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's there's no excuse anymore for not saying that you stand with Black Lives Matter. There's no excuse for siding with prosecutors, especially if you are a person of color. There's no excuse as a Democrat to do any of those things. And let's just, you know, talk about the elephant in the room. Joe Biden is older. And if she were to potentially inherit the seat of assumed position as president, that is her legacy. She's looking at a country as a young, you know, she's 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 younger than Joe Biden. Right. Um, Every actually as, everybody living is. <laughs> Fun fact. I don't know if people knew that, but yeah, yeah I just <laughs> looked it up. Man, old, old father time is assume <laughs> is going to be assuming office. Yeah. Um, so she's she's going to be uh, assuming office and she could potentially be in office for as many as 12 years. I'm just like going to lay it out there. Right. So she is going to be a representative of the Zoomers, millennials who see the world in a different way fundamentally because they've experienced the pains of neoliberal, you know, targeting um, criminal justice, a quote, criminal justice that has imprisoned one in three black men. Those are fathers. Those are communities that, that, that millennials and Zoomers have grown up in that have been disrupted where they never had the opportunity to, to fight back. And so she has to, to be a better leader because generationally this is about what's coming next. And she has to be thinking that way rather than how does she get in office based on the neoliberal policies that exist today and the, and the corporate funding that gets people in office today or yesterday. It's about how does she move forward? How does she move this country forward? And how is she, uh, the democratic, uh, potential vice president and president that will be written in the history books, not only just the fact that she's a woman of color, but she could potentially be the first woman president. So there's a lot to live up to here. This is a huge, huge moment in history. And I just want to emphasize that over and over. This is seismic, seismic. I think that something that people haven't uh, aren't talking about yet, but I'm sure will when the analysis gets really into minutia is how excellent she is under pressure. Specifically, I'm thinking about yeah. when she had opportunities to question as a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, both Brett Kavanaugh and Bill Barr, who I just watched that clip again, Nomi, and Bill Barr actually melts into his seat under her questioning. And we can also look at the debates, which are, you know, a dog and pony show, of course, but she's good yep. under pressure. She is. Yeah. No, that's that's a really good point. Um, and that's, you know, this would mean like if she's she's a lawyer, she's she's a a tested lawyer. She has appeared in the courtroom and that's tough. I don't think people recognize how tough it is. And right. so she's definitely um, got the experience there. When you say that, I mean, you, I, mm-hmm. when you ahead. say that you'll, you know, the progressives will, you know, hold them uh, accountable, Biden and Kamala Harris, won't it be, wh- how, you know, how do you think they would govern? I mean, I'm getting way ahead of myself here, but I mean, do you, do you think that'll have to be something because are they going to be too moderate? Are they going to, I mean, isn't this the time to go mm-hmm. big in terms of a prog- progressive agenda? Isn't it again, not yeah. that risky to be really progressive in such a divided country, especially when we're thinking about yeah. healthcare, the environment, civil rights? Yeah. I mean, it shouldn't be right. It should not be a risk to say, Oh, I am going to be the, 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 president who is going to prioritize uh, solving issues related to climate change, which is right here, right now. I mean, there's droughts and wildfires and tornadoes and a storm, a super storm that's formed as we speak that are affecting people's lives. And if you are from a frontline community, we know how much that impacts you even more so. Um, And of course, COVID intersects with this in that you see how rapid things accelerate if you don't deal with them in a timely way. As 
as the Trump administration hadn't, as frankly, the Cuomo administration hadn't. You know, he praises himself, but there were hundreds of thousands of deaths, um, you know, across this country that stemmed out of New York City. And so, uh, and that's part of that is because there was too much of a turf war happening between a city, a, a mayor and a governor who didn't want to deal with things that were right at right. there because they were too concerned about the money. Right. They were too concerned about pissing off donors. And so I, I, I don't see, sec- I don't see Kamala Harris and hopefully Joe Biden um, hears this as well, but I don't know for sure. I don't see her at least um, really uh, folding under, these are, these are really interesting. These are important issues. And I don't think that she's been conditioned to ignore them the way that maybe um, Joe Biden had or his colleagues. And frankly, like there's a lot of lessons to be learned out of the Obama administration. Um, I think there's probably gonna be a lot of folks that were in his administration that move over without a doubt. Uh, But uh, they have to learn their lessons. I mean, you don't reward the banks after they collapse your economy. You don't continue taking that money. And by the way, there's 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 proof now that you don't have to rely on that money right. to get elected. Right. So why are you doing this? What's the point? Let's shift this. You want campaign finance reform? Let's do it. Let's do it. All great points. Awesome analysis. Thank you for joining me on short notice. And uh, great, I really Pete. appreciate it, Noiki. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Okay, next I'm going to call Professor Christina Greer, Dr. Christina Greer of Fordham University. She is a real life political scientist. Let's see if she answers. Hello. Hi. Hi. Dr. Christina Greer, please. (laughs) This is she. Oh, I thought I'd be (laughs) getting her assistant. uh, Right. Oh, listen, I I wish (laughs) I'm like the assistant, the housekeeper, the chef, you name it. (laughs) Oh, you wear many hats in your household. Yes. I heard you actually literally change hats. Is that accurate? (laughs) Yes, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for talking to me. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. I love it. Uh, I love it. I love it. Even though, even though I feel like you like Jason and Ellie more than me, but that's okay. That's a different podcast. We'll get to it another time. That's actually (laughs) actually not true. First of all, um, Ellie is, both of them are flaky. Flaco. I yell at Jason all the time about being late. Because I'm a stickler but, for being on time. Yeah, I am too. But th- but like both of them, especially Jason, I'll be texting with and he'll just drop off and I won't, right. he won't give that to me for like a week. Or I'll be like, you good for tomorrow? And uh, he'll be like, yeah. And then we'll hear like he's a little flake and Ellie is kind of the same way, but th- not the case. And we have to do a much longer conversation soon. It's been far too long. Um, and I want to do a conversation with you with them or anybody else. That would be fun yeah. as well. So. Um, but tonight, I just want to get your quick take, of course, on what did uh, what it all means. Um, and of course, what I'm talking about is the keto diet. Your thoughts? No, Kamala Harris. <laughs> um, are you surprised? Like, Wait, what, is, what do you want to talk? No, I mean, she's been the front. Kamala Harris has been the front runner for quite some time. Um, and I think that it's it's the choice that uh, we knew Joe Biden was probably going to make. I mean, I know that there was some conversation about Susan Rice, but, you know, she's never run for office. He would have to introduce her to. The American public. She's very closely allied with uh, the Clinton family and also Barack Obama. So, you know, you'd be asking for Benghazi 2.0 and just a lot of uh, sort of harkening back to the past. So, I mean, this isn't a surprising pick. And in many ways, it's, it's a traditional pick for a traditional candidate. Right. And what do you think, if anything, her vulnerabilities are? Well, I mean, she has she has a few. Right. But I think it's up to the administ- the Biden campaign team to keep it forward focused. Right. So obviously we know Donald Trump is going to try and pull up. I mean, he's going to pull up high school essays. Right. Uh, but he's going to talk about her time as AG. He's going to try and link her to prisons. Not such that he could get black women necessarily to come over and vote for him, but to have enough in his arsenal so that he can get black men to abstain from voting. And mm. some will possibly vote for him. But the, the real goal is to to have people have the lesser of two evils argument and just say, I don't like either. So I'm going to stay home. That's the, the ultimate goal. I think what Biden and Harris need to do, though, is say, like, listen, the past is the past. Right now, we have 160,000 plus people who have died under this administration. We have over 40 million people who are unemployed. And that number is counting up every single day, along with coronavirus deaths. So. We can haggle over a a giggle that I made or a policy that I signed in, you know, a decade ago, or we could focus on what is happening right now and ask yourself, are you better off under this presidency or do you want to take a chance 
with a totally different vision where maybe your parents and your loved ones don't die. And also you might actually have a job. <laughs> yeah, those are pretty good arguments. I mean, it seems like if there are any uh, punches that land, bad choice of words, if there's any fair criticism of Senator Harris, it would come from the left. It's not going to come from the right. It's certainly not going to come from President Trump. Well, it will come from President Trump, right? Because we know that he he doesn't care. Like, he doesn't respect his own party, right? So he'll make this argument that she, uh, you know, incarcerated people or whatever conservative policies that his colleagues support wholeheartedly. But he'll say them because he knows that the left is listening. So he'll say it enough times, not because he disagrees with the policy, but he just wants sort of more of the progressive wing of the party that possibly wanted to say an Elizabeth Warren or, you know, a, I don't know, Stacey Abrams or, you know, whomever it may be, he's going to say that just to try and get people to be dissatisfied with the Biden selection. Interesting tweet I'm, I, I read right before I called you. And, and uh, yeah, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi shared this uh, from a black woman named Keith Makiba Lemon. Do you know who that is? I don't know who that is. No. But she wrote, I don't trust black folks who, in spite of all of our critical faculties, fail to feel a fleeting joy when we get something we deserve. I don't trust black folks who, in spite of our experience, fail to critique the love of a black winner has for black folks. I'm happy, sad and scared. Do you know what she means? Because I don't. Uh, Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, listen, for a lot of voters, Kamala Harris is not their ideal candidate for black voters, that is. And I think that there's. There's a way in which black people exist in this country that is filled with such anxiety and despair that like finding this, you know, there's a reason why this kind of black boy joy, black girl joy is like a movement, because I think for so long people have felt guilty in joy and like Mm. savoring this pleasure because it's been snatched. Right. I mean, we've seen it. I mean, I don't know if you ever saw the color purple, but like. The, the scene that sort of shook everyone to the core is like when Miss Sophia, Oprah Winfrey, finally gets to be with her family and the white woman says, I want to go home one minute after she's there and the joy is gone. And so I, I think that there's always this complicated dance that black people have existing in this country with the white gaze where it's like, we know that Kamala Harris is not perfect. I dare you to find an individual or a political candidate who is so We have to sort of, why can't we revel in the fact that this is a win? It's a win for black women. It's a win for black people. It's a win for Indian people. It's a win for people from California. It's a win for people who went to HBCUs. It's a win for people who went to Howard University specifically. It's a win for the AKAs. It's a win for the Divine Nine, which are the black fraternal and sorority organizations. I mean, it's it's a lot of wins in one. I mean, it's a win for the Jewish community, right? And so this idea that like, let's savor it. Why? Because she's married to a Jewish? Is Is that what you mean? Yeah. Her, yeah, her, husband never, her husband is Jewish and we've never had uh, a, a, a Jewish uh, first lady or first man, hmm. you know, in, in the White House in any capacity. Yeah, uh, Joe, Joe, really... Lieberman, Joe Lieberman could have been, you know, with with um, Al Gore, but that didn't happen. I mean, I think, you know, I always remind my students, I think it's really interesting. The only two sort of like wasps, like non wasps that we've ever had in the White House are John F. Kennedy and Barack Obama. You know, the first Irish <laughs> Catholic and the only Irish Catholic and Barack Obama, you know, black is African of African descent. Really and good so, point. And, yeah. And coincidentally, they're the only two whose last names end in a vowel, which sort of says something about immigration. Oh, um, interesting. Just a point. Yeah, yeah. No, no good. other president's last name ends in a vowel. And so like, yes, we'll have our second Catholic president. But, you know, there's a level of diversity that Kamala Harris brings. She and her family bring into uh this this discussion, which I think should be joyous, but we're in incredibly dark times. And we also know just as women and as people of color and as women of color, especially, we know that the level of disgust that she is going to have to face. <laughs> yeah. Like we we know it. Like yeah. if I feel it in my workplace, we know that we can magnify that by yeah. God knows how much. I but mean, we she- saw what happened to, to Michelle Obama. Right. You know, she. She was referred to as, you know, having a baby daddy. She's living in government housing when she moved into the White House. I mean, there's so many ways that uh, she was just vilified. Well, yeah, I mean, it's and it's still happening to her. 
Uh, but it's been happening to you and Kamala Harris and every black woman for their life, their, their entire life. And so to some extent, they're used to it. And in her case, probably ready for it. What about, you know, you talk about the dark times that we're in. And with Joe Biden being the nominee, the big problem was he didn't really bring a lot of energy. He's been around forever. He's very old. And today seems like the first time in these dark times, politically, at least, that we've got something to be excited by. How, how would you articulate this moment uh, of, of selection of Kamala Harris on the ticket today? Well, today it's like it is. It should be a moment of celebration. You know, I mean, this is this is why people choose a, a, a candidate that's going to invigorate a base of the party for a particular period of time. You know, he's going to ride the media wave this week, and then next week they've got uh, the convention, which will hopefully extend. And you know, the excitement, and we'll hear from both of them and see their families and their blended families. And then the hard work begins, trying to craft a strategy of what it looks like to target voters from across the country in the middle of a global pandemic um, and really hitting home why it is that our lives are so different in the middle of a global pandemic. And especially as parents are trying to figure out what they're going to do with themselves, since many of them will not be able to send their children back to school. And so I think that they're in a unique moment because no, they won't be able to campaign in the same way, but they can also explain to voters why they can't campaign in the same way because of the incompetence of the president. The thing about both Joe Biden and Kamala Harris that I notice is that they are they, they both are tough, but they both seem to have a, a real sense of empathy. Of course, uh, if you know Joe Biden's story, you know the pain that he's gone through, the losses that he's gone through. But Kamala Harris also has that ability to show empathy, empathy to uh, people's real pain. And, and that's something that we've lost for the last almost four years. Right. Well, I mean. Anyone compared to the president, you know, we could take a cardboard box and they've got more empathy than the president. And I think that there's a level of com- compassion that both of them have that is that is real. And that's where Joe Biden really thrives. And I think Kamala Harris's level of empathy uh, when when hearing stories about unemployment or poverty or whatever it may be will will be an addition, because I think some people are, are you know, I know a lot of people are really struggling and they're going to need someone who they feel like hears them and respects them and appreciates them in a way that the president just doesn't. I mean, when he says, you know, oh, one person dying is too much. He has to read that off of the paper yeah. because he just doesn't <laughs> yeah, even. Yeah, he really does. He just doesn't feel it. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's funny because I uh, just remember him reading. I say, saying that today. And, and of course, he was reading it. And I was like, yeah, he doesn't. He, he would never have said that on his own. He, when he was no. on his own, he said it is what it is. What do you say to those on the left that would criticize Kamala Harris's history as attorney general? Uh, yeah, her prosecution like, you know, of black folks or, you know, her, her coziness with big money donors, I guess, are some of the criticisms of yeah. the past. What do you say to them? Uh, I would say what Jason and John, Jason Johnson and I just discussed, it's like, look at the 160,000 people who have died. Look at the 40 million people who are unemployed. Yes, that is a bad record that she has at certain points in time in her career. Yes, she has made missteps. Will she be anywhere near what we're facing? Absolutely not. Do we need to look at sort of the changes that she's made in the past few years absolutely and it's like if we're using a litmus test from 10 years ago when we know the realities of what's what is happening today then you were going to vote for trump anyway so let's let's figure out another voter uh awesome 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 analysis as uh, always i really appreciate you joining me uh in a moment's notice okay take care thanks be for safe wear right. a mask all, all right, right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. all right that is dr christina greer you can follow her on twitter at DR underscore CM Greer. You heard her mention Jason Johnson. She'd just done another broadcast just before me with him. So I just talked to her and now I've got him. That's right. My final guest, uh, last but certainly not least, is my good friend, Dr. Jason Johnson, who had some more controversial, I guess. I don't know. Who cares? Everybody just calm down, okay? Just calm down. There are going to be criticisms of every politician and most of what you hear dr jason johnson say comes from his actually his own students we got a little bogged down on when i was asking him about him i should have sticked stuck with uh, kamala harris but nonetheless it was uh, great as always i love his analysis and i love this guy i hope you'll follow him on twitter as well at dr jason johnson here is my final guest of today's special show hey Dr. Jason Johnson. How are you? How are you? Uh, better than you, according to the mentions on your <laughs> last tweet. What did you say on MSNBC? 
what I said is the truth. (laughs) (laughs) Get this annoying man off my TV. Now, listen, you wrote an article uh, last, what, fall, uh, saying that uh, Kamala Harris should be the pick, right? Yep. And I'm not sure what people are reacting to. You wrote Joe Biden's VP pick. Better be a black woman, and it needs to be Kamala Harris. You wrote that back in April, I should say. I wrote that in April. Okay. April. <laughs> and then tonight, you went on MSNBC, and I don't know what you said, but some people, <laughs> according to the mentions... Uh... So so here's, here's what it is. Here's what it is. And I don't... This doesn't shock me because, you know, I'm just candid. Please don't um, put this irritating man in your guest panel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's, here's what people don't like. The best, the I'm, best I'm sorry, people, I have to cancel you. you I can't, yeah. According to that mention, you're off. My panel. The vast majority, the vast majority were positive. There were about four or five people who were upset. The reason they were upset is because, and you know, that this is the thing, Pete, and I always think this is very, it makes me chuckle. It really, really does make me chuckle on a lot of different levels because... I and are we are we being recorded? Are we just talking. Yeah, no, we're recording. Yeah. So, so I, I'm I'm going to say this. And I'm going to be I'm going to be hundred percent candid about it. Like I don't have a dog in any of these fights. I mean, I don't. You know, I, I, I you know, I no one actually knows. No one publicly knows which candidates I actually like. I always look at these things as far as who do I think can win, who do I think can beat Trump. I don't have a I don't have a real personal motivation one way or another. I think a lot of people, when they watch folks on television on a regular basis or read their writing, they they think that we're supposed to be cheerleaders or advocates, and we're not. Um, We say what we think works based on our research, our opinion, and our sources. I read off, uh, and one of my paraphrase, I read off some of the texts that I got from my students, uh, you know, all of whom are like, you know, 25 and under African-American students. When Eric got the nomination, because I, I once we got picked, because I text everybody, I was like, "Hey, what do you guys think?" Mm-hmm. It was universally, except for one kid who's an AKA. That I read her tweet. That I read her text. It was universally meh. It was universally like she's a cop. I don't trust her. I don't think she's authentic. That is what my students say. And these are young people, and some of them are recent graduates. Some of them are still in school. And I say that. Because that's going to be her job. Because if you're going to win a presidential election where there's going to be massive voter suppression across the country, you've got to have young people who are ready and enthusiastic and willing to download ballots and drop them off or stand in line or do what they need to do to vote. And I've always thought that Harris was going to be Biden's pick. I thought she was the best pick for him, given what he's likely to do and what her personality is like and what his personality is like. It's never been an issue of qualifications, but it's also just the fact that the matter is, look, Senator Harris always had struggles with young people. And there's a certain stratum of black folks that really like her, but there's a certain stratum of black folks that weren't ever feeling her. And, and, and when you say things like that, when you tell the truth, some people don't want to hear it because they expect advocacy. Uh, Some people say you're supposed to be a cheerleader. No, because if everybody gets on the air, if everybody gets on the radio, if everybody writes and jumps up and down and cheerleads all the time, that's how you lose. Somebody got to be out there and say, hey, look, there's another side to this coin. I want Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to win the presidency because I want my country to be saved from a pandemic, grotesque corruption and a white nationalist administration. But I'm not dumb enough to say that the people who have been selected to carry that banner to save this country are flawless. And if we don't make their flaws clear so that they can fix them, they won't win. The problem I think that you're encountering with your commentary is the timing of it. We are so (laughs) desperate for hope. We're so desperate for anything that is even close to inspiring that for you to be critical in any way on a national platform On the day that Joe Biden chooses Kamala Harris is just not going to sit well, people. And you knew that going in. Well, yeah, but you know what? It's funny. (laughs) And you and I have had this conversation both on the air and off. If I ever stop being who the heck I am because I'm worried about what the audience is going to say, then I'm not me. 
You know, I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm not me. I'm, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to tell as I see it. Trust me. If I got nothing but text messages from students saying, oh, my God, we're so excited. That's exactly what I would have said. But like what? And I'm just talking about students. I'm not talking about my friend in Ohio. And, and, and again, I talk about this a lot, you know, with you and on the air, a, a good, good amount of my personal friends and, and colleagues and stuff like that. They have nothing to do with media. They don't do this stuff all day. Right. They're not caught up in this world. And I had this discussion back and forth with with a you know professional colleague of mine who's like, oh, I'm so excited and blah, blah, blah. And you don't understand. You don't understand what this means to me. I was like, yeah, I know what it means to you. A highly educated 50-year-old black woman who's a super duper high profile lawyer because you identify with Senator Harris. But my friend who works as an administrator at a bank, you know, in Cleveland, Ohio, she doesn't look at Senator Harris and say, that's me. And she's Greek. She's like, eh. You know, she, she, you know, and so like the important thing is that she can do the job. The important thing is that she can go out and campaign. And the important thing is, you know, I don't think Senator Harris ends up making a difference one way or another as to whether or not Joe Biden wins. Really? But I think, oh, no, it, it wouldn't win. It, it, here's the thing. There is, he could have done this wrong because there was only one right answer. And I, I, I wrote this this week, uh, Pete, and some people, you know, had some, you know, they had their thoughts. But, hey, I mean, I mean look, if, I, if I'm the Simon Cowell and the Skip Bayless of this game, then hey. <laughs> <laughs> Because everybody still tunes in to see what Simon Cowell has to say. Right. Um, but but here's the thing. I said, like, Biden kind of screwed this up. It's not the first time he's done this. He did this. You look back 10 years ago, eight years ago, when gay marriage, right? O Obama had this whole brilliant way he was going to roll out gay marriage. Election year, we're going to do it. And what did Biden do? He just blurted it out like eight months early and ruined everything. And Obama's like, mm, you know, like, is it? like I, I wrote this piece. I was like. You know, Joe Biden is the guy who can't keep a secret. Joe Biden is the guy. He's he's your friend who's still in the driveway with a handful of balloons when you're bringing your wife up for her surprise party. You're like, dude, just, <laughs> just wrecked it. Funny. Playing all these. Well, and, and, and I, the reason I say that is because once he said last year and he let the rumor continue and didn't stop people from thinking and believing, oh, I'm going to pick a black woman. Mm -hmm. The, the list was already done. Like, right. I, I'm not shocked or surprised by this. Do you think that somebody else would have done more for the ticket, energized the ticket more? Because most of the people I talked to uh, for, for today's episode said that she does bring a lot of energy and enthusiasm, especially amongst black women. Senator Who are Harris, the backbone of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Senator Harris brings a lot of enthusiasm and energy for a certain strand of black women, many of whom we're already going to be super voters. So I, I wrote, I wrote a, a couple of weeks ago uh, when the, people were talking about Warren and I did, you know, I, I went and pulled a bunch of different black women that I knew and just you know, took their quotes anonymously. And there were several women who would say, look, you know, if Joe Biden picked Elizabeth Warren, I still vote democratic, but I probably wouldn't, I probably wouldn't volunteer. Right. They, they very much wanted a black woman, but you got to remember Senator Harris has an appeal to a certain kind of black woman. I, I'm I'm talking about this. I'm not just talking about numbers. I'm talking anecdotally. And no, again, this doesn't mean that she's not good because all I've written is that I thought she was going to be the nominee because I thought she was the best person for it. But I only know two African American women in my entire personal non media life who are Harris supporters. Hmm. Most of the black women that I knew, they were Biden from the beginning. I knew some Buttigieg women. Uh, I actually knew one sister who was like a fan of Amy Klobuchar. It never made any sense to me. Um, <laughs> you know, but, like, but like I didn't know I didn't know a lot of women who were who were jumping up and down and screaming Harris. And these are college educated, professional black women. They just don't do politics all the time. But I think to a certain strand of black woman who is important, I'm not diminishing this. But there's a certain strand of black women who see and identify and feel seen with a woman like Senator Harris, and therefore they're really excited. And that matters. There are some black men who didn't see themselves in Barack Obama. Right. You know, they still voted, but they didn't see this like, that ain't really me. I ain't grew up in Kansas. 
Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go to Harvard. So I, I think we have to be, we have to be reasonable about notions of, of, of being seen notions of, you know, one of my students, like I said, texted me and she commented on the fact that she was, you know, she liked Andrew Yang. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know many black Yang supporters either <laughs> who weren't on his staff. Right. But, you know, when I, t- you know, but she was not particularly enthusiastic about Harris. One of my students who texted me is actually one of the protesters um, out in Portland. And he was like, look, you know, I know about Harris. We hear about her up here all the time. I don't really think she does anything for 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 our movement one way or another. Really? Yeah. Hmm. So, you know, but but at the end of the day, I still think it was the best choice. It was the best choice of what was available because if you're if you're if you're picking a black woman, and this is the part that may or may not get me in trouble, but you know me, um <laughs> your your options were Karen Bass, Val Demings, Stacey Abrams, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Right? And yeah, I mean those are pretty much people you could pick. Stacey Abrams would have been a fantastic choice, would have galvanized people, way more people, way more people at many, 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 many levels. But she would not have made, I always talk about the fact that you have your public and then you have your private and then your political vet. The fact that Stacey Abrams was not a governor made people apprehensive about her. Right. And she become governor would be a whole different conversation. Right. But she was wrong. You know, Val Demings, it's like, okay, Val Demings is great, but like, what does Val Demings bring you that you can't get from Harris? Not really anything. Harris is already known, national figure, blah, right. blah, blah. You know, if Harris is going to get hit about being a prosecutor, you know Val Demings, she's a cop. It would have been worse, an right. actual cop. Right. Um, nobody knows who Karen Bass is. She wouldn't have had time to raise her profile. Susan Rice would have been a disaster. Um, I, I mean, like, all the Benghazi stuff, too many links to Obama and Clinton. Um, and, and, you know, and her son is like a Trump supporting right winger. Like it just would have been a mess. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Liability. How would they uh, even ever really? vetting her if that was the case? That's tough. Yeah. Like, mm. like, and, and that's not insider stuff. Like it's, that's been known. Right. Like he's, right. yeah. So, you know, and then you, you have Keisha Lance Bottoms, which again, a very, very, you know, if, if you're going to pick someone who's never gotten higher than the state level, you wouldn't pick Keisha Lance Bottoms over Stacey Abrams. Like, if you're going to go right. there, why don't you pick the woman who's nationally famous? Well, you broke it down perfectly. Great analysis. It might not be what people want to hear, but that's not what you are doing this for. So yeah. I appreciate <laughs> your honesty, as always, and I appreciate you being available to me tonight. And uh, I'll talk to you, hopefully, maybe later this week with either yeah, we got to get and, on with Ellie and schedule some other things. We yeah, should talk yeah. to my mom about Harris. That'll be fun. I, I was thinking about that. Uh, yeah. All right, but I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay, that's it. I want to thank all of my guests. We started with Danielle Moody. Listen to her podcast. Then I talked with Midwin Charles. Follow her on Twitter. Then I spoke with April Rain. Follow her on Twitter and Instagram as well. I reached out to Nomiki Konst. You should listen to her great show at Sam Cedar's Majority FM Network. And I also talked, of course, to Dr. Christina Greer, who's great. Definitely follow her on Twitter. Read everything she's writing. and She's got a great book. And finally, Dr. Jason Johnson joined me. And that's all I've got for you today. I am out of time and sobriety. It's time to drink some wine and go to bed. I'm Pete Dominic. Follow me on Twitter as well, at Pete Dominic and Instagram and Facebook. Like the Facebook page, like the podcast. And has anybody noticed that this mic in the last two episodes is not the same high quality you're used to? The new studio is coming. I'm Pete Dominic. You're not alone. I love you. I'll talk to you tomorrow right here on Stand Up.